So, this video is going to be uh, the first one from Chapter 5. Uh, chapter 5 is titled Water and Seawater, but I usually just call it the Chemistry Chapter. Um, I don't know, normally this is kind of mostly a review chapter for uh, the students in my class, but because you guys are the first class um, that was a, well, the only uh, group of um, chem kids at St. Joe's, I'm not sure we did as much marine chem. So, I will go slower than I normally do. So, water. If we're going to talk about oceanography, um, you know, obviously we need to talk about the ocean. If we're going to talk about the ocean, we have to talk about water. Water is um, prevalent in all living things on this planet. It's sort of one of the defining characteristics. It makes up um, anywhere between um, half to almost 100% in the jellyfish of all living organisms. And um, here are some numbers. There's sort of this myth out here that humans are 95% water. We're not. We're actually only 65% uh, water. The only animal that's really, you know, almost completely water is jellyfish. But plants are pretty close. Um, our blood is 83% uh, water, which is kind of interesting. And um, between the two of those things, we're kind of similar um, to the planet. We reflect almost as much water as the surface of the planet has. So people talk about the importance of water. Hopefully you know this. Um, you've probably heard the term the universal solvent thrown around, which is an important characteristic of water, um, but that's not actually the main one. Water is important because it allows all life on this planet to exist, and that's kind of um, because of a couple of physical characteristics we're going to talk about. Now, to talk about water on a physical level, we have to talk about its atomic structure. So, just to review an atom, um, I know you got this, but, you know, um, it can't be done enough. There are some words on here you need to know. Proton um, and neutrons are the uh, subatomic particles that exist in the nucleus of an atom. Here's a really horrible drawing of a Bohr's model atom. Here's the nucleus. Um, and then there's the protons and the neutrons inside. Neutrons have no charge. Protons have a positive charge. The, the protons are sort of the identity of the atom, and the electrons are its personality. So the electrons are found on the outside, and they're the part of the atom that do most of the um, interacting. Uh, and the, it's important to know when we're talking about water about the electrons and their negative charge because it causes a bunch of the characteristics. The water molecule itself, the, I'm telling you, you need to be able to draw it. Um, make sure you know how to draw it. There's a couple different ways it's drawn. There's the one that's here is sort of the classic drawing, but it's made of one oxygen and two hydrogen. Please don't mess that up and turn it around the other way. Um, not the same thing. It has covalent bonds holding the atoms together. So there's a covalent bond um, right in here, right there, and another one here. As you probably remember, covalent is when they share electrons. So some of the time, um, let's take a step back. Oxygen has eight electrons. Um, there's two in the inner shell and six in the outer shell. The outer shell actually wants to have eight. That's called an octet, and it's stable. Um, oxygen needs two more atoms in order to have a full octet. Hydrogen only has one electron, um, and that electron... Uh, is just by itself. It's in the first energy level, which is, to be stable, has two electrons. And in um, what happens is oxygen attracts two hydrogens, which share their electron, bringing oxygen up to the full octet. And in exchange, some of the time, it shares one of its outer electrons, bringing hydrogen up to its full um, shell of two. So that's a covalent bond, and it's a strong bond. What happens is there is not um, equal sharing of these electrons. The electrons are attracted to whoever has more protons. Oxygen has more protons. It has eight. So most of the time, the electrons are close to the oxygen. And this causes polarity. Um, and what happens is if, if the electrons are found around the oxygen more often in this area, oh, my pen's not working, um, if, if it's found in this area, um, this causes there to be basically 10 electrons around the oxygen, which makes it slightly more negative. If there were 8 electrons and there are 8 protons, it's neutral. But because it's gained 2 electrons by sharing with hydrogen, it now has 10. So it is a little bit negative. The hydrogens, which have 1 proton and 1 electron, um, kind of got swindled in the deal, and their electrons gone most of the time, which means that they're mostly positive. Um, and this causes polarity. One section, this one, has a negative end, and there are two positive ends 
in the water molecule. And this leads to almost all of the unique characteristics of water that we're going to talk about, but that's where polarity comes from. And you should be able to explain polarity and why it occurs. This is a picture in the book of a bunch of hydrogen, uh, excuse me, a bunch of water molecules hanging out together. And they do. Uh, water is almost never found all by itself. It, water sticks to itself. This is called cohesion. And it, water's ability to stick to itself is one of the highest of any molecule, uh, natural or otherwise. And this is because, remember, we said that the oxygen is negative and the hydrogen is positive. So on two different molecules, we have two right here, um, the negative end of one is attracted to the positive end of another. Um, this is called a hydrogen bond, and it is much weaker um, than a, uh, the covalent bond but it's strong enough that causes water to kind of clump together. And this characteristic of water allows it to dissolve most things because that positive end and that negative end interrupt many other chemical bonds, including ionic bonds, which is why salt dissolves so readily in water. Uh, you should be able to draw a picture um, of three hydrogen, excuse me, three water molecules with hydrogen bonds designated within them as well as the charges. So make sure you can do this. This picture is a pretty good one to show you kind of what three of that would look like. So how does water work as a solvent? Um, what happens is in an ionic bond, there is a positive, um, usually a metal, uh, in this case it's sodium, attracted to a negative um, non-metal, chlorine, and they form what we call that crystal lattice structure, which you probably learned about in chemistry. And what happens is, um, and you, this picture is really good, this picture's in the book, 5-4, and uh, you can see that the water molecules, there's four of them here, it's not really that perfectly even, um, the water molecules completely surround each of the ions. So the, because the sodium is positive, it surrounds it with the negative oxygen end, end on the inside towards the sodium. And uh, when it's surrounding the, the anion, the chlorine, it's the positive ends in. And this is, what, this is actually what the term hydration means. I know we always think hydration means drink lots of water, uh, but hydration is a chemical process, and it reduces the attraction because there's now this sort of insulating buffer um, between the sodium and chloride. They can't be attracted to each other to the degree that they were anymore. Um, the magic number is 80 times. And... Uh, this allows the ocean to hold a ridiculous amount of salt, uh, 50 quadrillion tons or 50 million billions tons of um, salts, we'll just call it, are dissolved in what we call seawater. Water has one of the uniquest properties on the planet in that it can exist in all three states under natural conditions here. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but there are almost no other substances where that happens. Um, some things can exist as a solid and a liquid. Some things can exist as a liquid as a gas. Um, very few others, and only at the extremes, can exist in all three. This picture has water in all three uh, phases, we'll call them. Um, and that is the correct term to use, is phases of water. Um, we have solid, liquid, and gas. When you have um, more than one state of matter, you call it a phase. And we have ice is unique um, among the solids. Well, almost unique. Bismuth also has this ability. But it is fairly unique in that it can float um, on its liquid. And this is because as, again, that polarity, remember water was bent at 105 degrees, the magic number. When you try, it's almost like trying to force magnets together. But now the magnets are bent. So when you, when you can't, when they want to get as far away from each other, the positive, positive, and the negative, negative, don't like each other, it makes it form this very rigid crystalline system, uh, which you can see right here. And that lattice-like structure is actually forces the molecules farther apart because they all have to make bonds. When it's a liquid, only some of them are bonded, so they can sort of slide past each other and actually be closer together. And then finally we have gas where there's no bonds, no hydrogen bonds between any of the molecules, and it's in its most spread out state. So what does it mean to change state? Um, when you have a solid, um, like we have here, you have all of the molecules locked in place and all of the possible hydrogen bonds that could exist do. 
Um, that's what it means to be a solid. It, all of the bonds that could be there are. And a chemical bond, um, when you add energy to it, the kinetic energy increases and the molecules begin to move. Well, to move, they need to break bonds. So when you add energy, you're breaking bonds. And this is what, when we are dealing with solid ice, um, or is called melting. So at, when you add energy, um, some of the energy, actually most of it, goes into breaking those hydrogen bonds and breaking those molecules apart. Do they move completely apart? No, they just move apart somewhat because now it's just a liquid. They sort of slide past each other. Some of them still stuck together. It takes a lot more energy, um, we would call this vaporization, to get all of the molecules apart and have them all completely zero hydrogen bonds. So this is all hydrogen bonds, all the possible ones, and this is none. And this is sort of in the middle with some. Um, and to go the other way is the same thing. If you're starting with um, gas, vapor, uh, water vapor, and you cool it down, you remove the energy, it slows the molecules down, they bump into each other, they make more and more bonds, it becomes a liquid. Eventually, as you cool it down even farther and remove more energy, slow down the molecules, they make all of the possible bonds, and we've made a solid again. Um, this is going to be very important because we are going to mathematically show how water changes state. Now, we should take a step back and talk about heat versus temperature because they are not interchangeable. Heat is the energy of um, how much something is um, moving. And we generally use calorie in this class. I know you use joules in um, chem and physics, but we use calorie. And calorie is the amount of energy required to raise um, one gram of water one degree Celsius. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. So they're related, but they're not exactly the same. Um, and here are some of the temperatures. We use um, Celsius here. I know you use Kelvin in physics and chem. But um, this is one that kids forget sometimes. The freezing point is zero degrees Celsius. What's the melting point? Well, freezing and melting are the opposite things, so they actually occur at the same thing. Uh, the melting point is zero degrees. Hopefully you can figure out condensation point. Heat capacity and specific heat, I know you did learn in chem, but this is much more important here. Um, and they are interchangeable for the purposes of this course. And um, heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise temperature of a substance one gram by one degree Celsius. And um, we already talked about this. Also, the same definition for a calorie. Um, it takes one calorie to raise one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Water has what we call a very, very high heat capacity. If you look at it on um, the diagram here, right there. Um, compared to everything else, it takes a lot more energy absorbed to change the temperature of water. And this leads to a lot of things we're going to talk about with climate um, and why things probably evolved in the ocean first, but we'll talk about it later. And then there's um, substances with low heat capacity, which change temperature much more quickly. This is why, you know, on a hot day, you run across the asphalt or the sand to get to the beach, but the water can still feel fairly cool. So we, had, we talked about heat capacity and specific heat. Those were um, the ability to change the temperature within a phase, okay? So liquid water goes up this amount, um, solid water goes up this amount, gaseous water goes up this amount. Latent heat is the amount of energy to change state. And I always remember it as latent, it's statent. Uh, latent heat changes state. And it takes more energy to vaporize something than to melt something. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, the latent heat of melting is 80 calories per gram uh, for water, while the latent heat of vaporization is 540 calories per gram. And this becomes important because one of the things we have to be able to do is calculate how much energy it takes to change state um, when we're dealing with water. We kind of saw this already. All right. So... Imagine, if you will, and this will be the last thing we do in this slide, you have a pot, and um, you put a big chunk of ice in it, and you turn the heat on. So what's going to happen? Well, the, 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 initially, the temperature will be something. I don't know what it is. Something below zero, right? We'll put zero on here. Oh, let's go back. Go back. Okay. Um, initially, it's something below zero, right? Zero degrees is when it would begin to melt. And we start out here. And initially, as you add heat, what's going to happen? Well, the temperature is going to go up. It's going to go up until it reaches zero degrees. 
Well, what's going to happen at that point? Imagine you're looking at the pot. What do you see? Well, for a while, it's not going to change temperature. What's going to happen is you're going to begin to melt the ice. The temperature of that mixture of now liquid water and fr frozen water ice won't change temperature until all of it is melted. At that point, when it's all melted, it will begin to go up again in temperature as you add more and more heat. Eventually, you'll reach another magic number where it stops going up in temperature. And I think you know what that number is. It's 100 degrees Celsius. And for a long time, longer than it was with the, the melting, it's just going to vaporize. Well, what does that look like? Uh, ho hopefully you've done this at your home. You've made pasta. It boils. Okay, that, that's going to boil. And it's going to turn into water vapor. Eventually, all of it will be gone, and that steam could begin to raise in temperature again. This is the graph of the change in temperature and change in state of water. Um, many substances will look pretty similar. Now, let's talk about the things we know already. We talked about the latents, right? That is the, the amount of energy to change state. For ice to water, it takes... 80 calories, sorry, I'm writing this with my finger, my stylus broke, 80 calories per gram. Um, and, and that's a decent amount. We know the latent heat of vaporization is 540 calories per gram. So, so far, if we were to go from here to here, we would have put in at least those amounts. But there's also the amount of energy, the specific heat, to raise temperature. Well, for liquid water, we know that too. We know that it's one calorie per gram per degree Celsius. Oh, another thing in here. Now, from zero to 100 is 100 degrees. Uh, do a little quick math in your head. And you would have um, whoop, done 100 calories. Depending on what temperature you started at and what temperature you end at, you would add more calories. Now, believe it or not, it's actually easier to raise the temperature of ice than it is to raise the temperature of liquid water. It, for our purposes, we're going to say it takes a half a calorie, calorie per gram per degree Celsius. And same thing with steam, 0 0.5 calories. Tomorrow, in class, we're going to actually do some math with this, but these are some numbers that hopefully you can make neater in your notebook than I did here. So hang on to this.